Good evening. We'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, regular school board meeting Thursday, March 7th. Uh, Mr. Philo, could you call the roll, please? Ms. Landon. Here. Mrs. Millard. Here. Mrs. Webb. Mr. Steininger. Here. Mr. Browning. Here. Could we all stand for the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So next on the agenda is to approve the agenda as presented. If we could get a motion in a second. So move. Second. Mr. Philo. Mr. Steininger. Yay. Ms. Landon. Yes. Mrs. Millard. Yes. Mr. Browning. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next is to approve the minutes of the Thursday, February 1st regular meeting. Again, if we could get a motion in a second. So moved. Second. Mr. Philo? Mrs. Millard? Yes. Ms. Landon? Yes. Mr. Steininger? Yay. Mr. Browning? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next is board reports and good of the order. <laughs> we could start with Wendy? Sure. Fairborn Intermediate teachers Celeste Stevens, Jared Reed, Courtney Spiegel, and Lisa Van Hoos were awarded the Outstanding Instructional Practice Award from Wright State University. Congratulations and thank you for your continued focus on the best educational practices which promote student learning. We'd also like to thank or congratulate our girls wrestling team. Akaya Reinhardt is headed to the state wrestling meet, placing first in her regionals. Serenity Almer Ernest and Zion Glenn finished sixth in the regionals. So thank you to uh, Coach Spain um, and to the team. And I'd also like to say, um, uh, you know, thanks to Matt Klein on February 28th. I got to participate with them at Fairborn Primary School um, and their volunteers. They brought Spider-Man and they handed out shoes to approximately 50 children. So thank you to him and everyone that volunteered that day. Good. Tim? I'd like to congratulate the uh, Fairborn third grade Navy uh, base basketball team champions. The future is bright for our Fairborn basketball program. And I'd also like to thank the Fairborn High School Chorus and Music Programs for visiting the fifth grade at Fairborn Intermediate to highlight our musical programs and encourage participation. Uh, also, if you didn't notice in the news, there was a release that Fairborn High School was awarded the Career Center Educational Equipment Grant. Uh, and the high school is proud to announce this award of $820,000 and $615. It's put out by the Ohio Career Technical Educational Equipment Grant to enhance project lead, uh, lead the way. And I'll let Sue Brackenhoff talk about that more in a few moments. And this is a great deal for us and a significant amount of money. I'll let her finish with all the details. Thank you. Hit me. All right. So Fairborn High School held a blood drive on Thursday, February 29th, with a total of 55 donors registered to donate, and 33 of which were first-time donors. The goal was 35 units, and Fairborn High School collected 46 units, mm -hmm. achieving 131% of the goal. Fairborn Night at Wright State University included the FHSAFJROTC, <laughs> <laughs> Ohio 031, and Fairborn High School choirs, as well as the FHSASL students, or sign language students, who signed during the national anthem. We are extremely proud of all of our students. Thank you to the Fairborn Area Chamber of Commerce and Wright State Men's Basketball for the opportunity to come together as a community. Okay. okay. Uh, three of the intermediate uh, fifth grade classes visited the Ohio Supreme Court. Uh, they took a tour and were able to sit in on the uh, court chamber and participate in a mock trial. Uh, the classes on the field trip included Mrs. Wardle, Mrs. Hill, Mr. Reed, and Ms. Van Hoos. A uh, special thank you to the Ohio Supreme Court for providing the transportation grant for the students to make this trip. Uh, staff members stated that uh, these students did a great job and made Fairborn Schools proud. So I saw that and I thought that was really neat that the kids got to participate in that. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, uh, Green Giving, the Green County Community Foundation, there's a new scholarship that's just starting this year. 
Uh, it's in memory of Joe Morgan, who graduated in the class of 1975, and I actually ran track with him. Uh, it's four track athletes, and uh, they have to have a minimum of a 2.5 GPA and plan to uh, pursue higher education in Ohio. It can be at a tech school or a four-year school in Ohio. That's the only stipulation. Uh, just a couple other things. Uh, last week, got to participate with Rotary in terms of passing out books at the primary. And that's always a lot of fun, watching the kids, uh, uh, you know, as the, books, the book gets read to them and those kind of things. And, and Mr. Lawley was one of our great book holders to show them which page to turn at what time. Couldn't read it, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing was the choir. Last week, uh, they had, or actually Tuesday night of this week, had their uh, concert. They weren't able to do their concert in December because of all the illness we had. So uh, this was actually their first concert of the year, and it was eighth grade uh, through the high school choirs, and, and they did their normal outstanding job. So with that, we'll go on to recognition of visitors. Mr. President, I don't have anybody signed up tonight. Okay. Then we'll go to school district presentation. Mr. Lawley. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Just going to give you a kind of a brief update on where we're at with the construction of the new high school. Believe it or not, the substantial completion date for that high school is May the 31st. That's less than three months, so it's getting close. Um, let you know where they're at on some of the things. Uh, recently, the auxiliary gym was laid, and I think they may have completed that yesterday to, or today. There's still some work to do with the floor of staining and, and that type of thing. So the auxiliary gym floor is down for the most part. Also outside, it would be the um, south side, what else, south side of the high school or the side of the academic wing. They are laying that <coughs> concrete and uh, their goal is to finish up all the outside concrete here in the next week or so. And then when they get all that concrete work done, you're going to see the final uh, layer of the asphalt done once all that concrete work is done. So uh, making some great headway. If you walked into the main entrance area and the commons area, uh, they're in the process of uh, laying that terrazzo floor. And that's a heck of a process there. If you watch that, I had never seen it before. But uh, that's very tedious and time consuming. It takes a lot of time. So. They are in the process of doing that whole area as we speak. Um, in the next week or so, maybe sooner, they will start laying the floor to the arena. So all the wood is laying inside the arena, and that's just about ready to be put down. Uh, the Performing Arts Center is really coming along. Uh, it's looking beautiful and uh, making some progress there. Uh, the band turf field, or the uh, all-purpose turf field in the back of the school, I think they are just about finished laying uh, all the lettering in the end zones, the yard markers, and the logo at the, at the center of that field. Um, athletic Training Center has started. They've laid the footers. They're getting ready to do, and I think they probably have already started the block work, so making some progress there. Um, the movers for... Uh, are still scheduled for June the 3rd to move this staff and equipment out of here June the 3rd. That'll be about a two week process and when they're finished with that, movers will start moving Baker staff and equipment <coughs> out of Baker into this building. So, whew, you gotta catch your breath sometimes yeah. everything being done, but I'm telling you, I don't know how many of you have not seen it, but uh, wait till you do. It's something that we're all gonna be very, very proud of. Okay, thank you. Uh, but I was just going to add a couple comments on that. Um, there's been a lot of questions on social media about the rock out front. Uh, the rock is getting moved to the new high school, and it looks like it's going to be moved over spring break when there's no cars here. So the class of 24 is going to have to paint the rock at the new, <laughs> new high school uh, when they graduate. And then also the arch out back. If you drive, you'll see that the arch is gone out back by the, uh, by the football practice field. It's now in place for the players to go through uh, when they take the game field at the new high school. So just trying to move some history from here to there. So okay. thanks, Gene. All right, next on the school district presentations, uh, Mr. Steininger mentioned the uh, Career Tech Equipment Grant. Uh, 
<coughs> receiving, I think it was 820,000, I don't have that in front of me, but the timing is impeccable as we move into the new high school. And uh, Dr. Brackenhoff has a great presentation uh, to show you with, uh, like, we, like I said, we're going to the state of the art, of the state of the art high school, and this is going to be state of the art equipment that uh, our, our staff and teachers, uh, te uh, I'm sorry, staff and students will have uh, in the new high school. So take it away, Dr. Brackenhoff. Well, I want to remind everyone this is a professional development day, so we're going to continue in that mode. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, unlike Mr. Philo, I'm not going to talk about just numbers, but I will start with just numbers. And our total gr uh, grant amount was $820,615, and it was broken down into three areas. So the state allowed us to, if we were going to expand or start a new program, so we went for the current programs in Project Lead the Way, which was our engineering pathway and our biomed pathway. And then um, Mr. Stiegel's uh, vision was that we would have a computer science pathway. So um, that was the, uh, the main part of our grant in those three areas. And so now I'm gonna talk about the exciting things. What is this actually going to look like? So some of the new equipment that we will see, this grant is solely for equipment. The professional development is on how to use this equipment. So the biggest part of, proj of Project Lead the Way Biomed, and something just happened, hold on one <laughs> second, <laughs> um, is the pur purchase of anatomage tables, and I cannot do it justice. All I can say is any school around the area has one. Fairborn High School will have three of these. And, okay. <laughs> Let's see if these links are. Reagan, is she back there? Do you know why this is? Oh, wait, here we go, here we go. Every Mike has a story to tell. Excuse me. Hiding practical experiences. Ten, eight, <coughs> Every Mike has a story to tell. With anatomizers table 10. Oh, there we go, thank you, but I'm trying to get. And then hit play. Journey through all stages of life is now possible. In its tenth iteration, Anatomage Table takes anatomical learning to the next level with refined technology and the highest level of accuracy. Learners can now visualize real anatomical details with unparalleled resolution across the Anatomage bodies, 3D cadavers derived from actual human bodies. In Table 10, Learners can also explore the impact of time, disease, on the aging body. Our newest anatomage body, Han, was a real-life individual with lung cancer who passed away at age 70. Han's offers real-world insight into various conditions, including tumors in the chest, pancreas, and liver. Table 10 not only offers a detailed look at the intricacies of human bodies, but also an collaborative lab activities that deliver authentic learning experiences to students. The latest enhancements to our anatomage bodies include simulations such as detailed blood flow tools, including vascular growth, that simulate an intricate roadmap of vessels and their branches across the entire cadaver's body. Blood particles can also be simulated for visualization. Our clinical simulation suite includes a catheter, providing the practical experience of how catheterization is performed on a real human body. Our rich database of histology allows students to analyze tissue structures, and students have the opportunity to interact with 3D scans of authentic cadaver flow sections, offering a true-to-life experience in cadaver study. Table 10 also elevates clinical training and care. From practicing customized surgical procedures and adapting to the unique anatomical variations of individual patients, to a 
expecting how the angle and rotation of an ultrasound probe may affect the field of view of internal anatomy. Exploring the inside of a human body with simulated endoscopic flight risk. Or investigating various heart rates and their corresponding ECG patterns so you can understand what they mean for your patient's cardiovascular well-being. Table 10 sets a new standard for studying anatomy and paves the way for an extensive scientific exploration into the human body that the world has never seen before. Join us on the journey today. There it is. <laughs> right, yeah, finally, <laughs> at the end. Okay. So that is our biggest piece of equipment. The other for our biomed program, um, Well, um, this is still with the inanimage, so I'm and I'm going to st stop this really quickly and go full screen. So the inanimage can be used for instruction, but one of the cool things that kids can get into is it's also used for competition. Um, and let me just give you a quick peek of this is the national inanimage. We're going to start. Three, two, one, and go. Good luck. Let's hear it for them. So students are given a problem to solve. All around the body now. Now we have flu fighters. The flu fighters have got two right. They're at 20 points. Two, he's got 19 points. They must have got one wrong before. They're talking about the rhomboid minor muscle now. And they got that correct. They got 29 points now. And the flu fighters have a perfect record. They've got four questions now. Four, four questions right now. They're talking about a couple of these muscles. I think this is done correctly. God knows I could not even be close to identify if I tried. So again, that gives you an idea of some of the exciting things that students will be able to experience as a result of that. The other major equipment purchase for the Biomed program is the Recessa Annie. Not only does it simulate real life the physical positioning, but there are um, electronic components that can be used for both instruction. component is really what sets this apart from um, some of the other and I'm gonna go ahead and cut that short there then so that takes care of equipment in our biomed program in our engineering program um, we are adding both uh, 3D printers, multiple ones, as well as laser engraving machines and a robotics arm. And I will just kind of give you a quick idea of the robotics arm. So it's not just um, understanding the programming that's connected with this. Um, we're not just talking about engineering as, uh, as a field of study, but in manufacturing, being able to make that connection. So this will be similar to what we're looking at. Students will learn to do programming to achieve a uh, small task. And again, in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of cut some of these even shorter than I did. And then the laser engraving machines, if you have, this is the exact, the model that we're looking at.
squirt it a little bit. Jeez. So you'll see that this kind of equipment isn't just um, educational versions. It is the real thing that's used in the industry. Um, then um, our last uh, area for our equipment grant is a computer lab. And this, we, um, we went to Wright State. We looked at uh, their computer lab. We were, luckily they had just purchased one and they worked really closely with us to give us lots of information. But I, I think what's important is we're getting not just the computers and all of the equipment, everything that we can use to make the lab, but it's the concept that this lab was built on. And this is just a, 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 a little two minute video, but I think if for those who were in the professional development sessions today, you'll kind of hear some things that um, we heard in other sessions about problem-based learning. Go toward simplicity, solve simplicity, and build it all back up to solve a big problem. I'm Travis Doom. I'm an associate professor right, of computer science and engineering. And so we don't see his, just his eyebrow. <laughs> okay. I'm the director of undergraduate programs for computer science and engineering. We attempt to embrace innovative change in all sorts of uh, venues, both in research and in education. Uh, this room's purpose is to kind of engage students in a state-of-the-art educational environment. The purpose behind this room is essentially this. Uh, in today's society, the professor is no longer the only source of information, and textbooks or the lecture is no longer the primary means of education. There's reading assignments, there's YouTube videos, both by the professor or by other leading researchers in the field. Um, really, when we get together in the classroom, the goal is no longer to see the material for the first time, but to exercise material, to learn what is useful in that uh, material, uh, to exercise critical thinking, and to get hands-on experience using it. Basically, it's discussion, it's actively involved learning, where the students don't just sit passively but they engage both with the instructor and other students. And this room is designed to do exactly that. So students get together in groups. We discuss, we work problems, they work with each other. They fight over the answer. Uh, ideally, the answers are such that different groups can have different answers that are both valid, but some are better than others. And we'll spend an entire class period talking about why one answer might be better than another in certain circumstances. And what we end up with is, um, a deeper and more mature learning process where students don't just cram for examinations, but they walk out of this uh, classroom with a retained knowledge that will last them for their careers. So again, it's not just the physical structure of the computer lab, but also looking at the methodology as far as part of that instruction. So we are really excited that this will be part of the brand new Fairborn High School. Um, the uh, award amount became public at 10.30 a.m. on Monday morning. And at 11 o'clock, we had our first meeting with the Anatomage people. And um, they can guarantee us delivery of our Anatomage tables for the July 17th opening. And um, they will also have somebody here to demonstrate for us. So when we open the new high school, we will be able to show some really cutting edge uh, technology. The Anatomage tables are of the quality, they are in medical schools, um, not just you know a, a high school instructional project. So that is my information on our Career Tech Grant. Any questions? That's really cool. When can we take class? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we can train as many people as we want. It doesn't cost any more. So we're That's hoping wonderful. we will be able to use these, um, you know, in some of our other science classes in the future um, after the grant. So then the Very next cool. thing. I am going to talk about, I'll just move right on to it, is um, Aaron's Law, uh, which is embedded in Ohio Senate Bill 288. 
And the requirement is by the end of the 23-24 school year that school districts must teach students about personal body safety, how to speak up and tell if they're being abused. And so we have um, sent letters out to families this week. And I wanna kind of give you some information on what it is we are required to teach and um, what our staff is going to be using. So uh, Fairborn Primary School is going to use a curriculum called Child Safety Matters and uh, Fairborn Intermediate and Baker Middle School are going to use lessons from Fight Child Abuse. These were all um, not mandatory that we select but um, the Department of Education had a list of appropriate programs that meet the needs. Our counselors, uh, mental health therapists got together and uh, reviewed this information and, um, and decided that would be appropriate. So we've selected programs that are appropriate for the age group. So that was for kindergarten through sixth grade, a requirement. Then we have some other required health topics. Some of these we've had in the past, but um, there's been some additions to it. We are required to teach dating violence prevention education as well as sexual violence uh, prevention in grades seven through 12. Um, we also have to include recognizing that dating violence warning signs and characteristics of healthy relationships. So the two curriculums that we'll be using in the middle school and high school for that are called violence-free relationships and safe date. Um, another component that we are required to teach in health in grades six through 12 on suicide prevention and social inclusion, which is a yearly re requirement. Um, the two uh, curriculums that they'll be using are signs of suicide, which we have been using, and sources of strength. And again, both of those were on the suggested or uh, list that was provided by ODE. The other component of this is parent notification. So this week, we started with the um, K through six requirements of Aaron's Law, and we sent letters home to primary, intermediate, and Baker sixth graders that inform parents that we are required to teach this, that we understand that these topics are sensitive topics, and um, that children may have questions and parents may have questions. Um, the parents have the right to review the, um, the curriculum. They can ask the building principal, but on each of the letters we've provided a QR code which leads them directly to the curriculum so they can do that um, from, from their home. And then any parent that wishes for their child to be excused from this required um, uh, curriculum can request it in writing to their, um, their child's school principal. And so all of this information went out this week. And uh, again, following state requirements, health is the one area in Ohio that um, the Department of Education has not defined standards for. In fact, the legislation says that they can't, but new laws have come into effect that um, requires us to address these special topics. So we're hoping that our families will, will um, read the letters, ask questions if they have concern, um, because I think our staff in each of the buildings does a really great job in presenting age-appropriate instruction to help all children be safe. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brackenhoff. Next presentation is from Director or uh, Supervisor of Food Services, Emmy Brown. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, I am here to present um, on behalf of the Child Nutrition Department, we received an administrative review from ODE this year, and we're just gonna quickly go over some of the components of that review. 
and then how we did on that review. So there were a lot of different components. I highlighted some of the, the more important ones here. The first one is gonna be certification and benefit issuance. So we had to go through about a quarter of our students here in Fairborn City Schools, provide their eligibility free, reduce or full pay, and then provide proof of that eligibility. So whether we received um, direct certification through the state, a free and reduced meal application, et cetera, on those students. The next topic is verification, which is actually a self audit process that the school district, the child nutrition department performs every year. And we pull a sample of our household income applications that are submitted and we essentially ask families for verification of that income, verification of any other information they provided on that application. We were audited on meal counting and claiming. So monthly, the child nutrition department submits claims to the state of Ohio. We say we served X amount of breakfast, X amount of lunches per building this month, and the state of Ohio reimburses us for those meals. So we were audited on how we count those reimbursable meals, our paperwork that supports those counts, so production records that are filled out by our cooks um, at each building, and then our actual um, sheets of paper that we record the numbers on. And um, we submitted those for audit as well. The dietary specifications and nutrition analysis. So again, we have a meal pattern that we have to follow. So we submitted our menus for Fairborn Intermediate breakfast and lunch for a week that was selected in November of this year. Um, and they review all components of the meal pattern and how we fulfilled those requirements. So essentially, are we serving the, the main components, a grain, a meat, a fruit, a vegetable, and a milk? And then do all of those components together meet the calorie, sodium requirements, um, fall within the saturated fat and trans fat requirements that the state offers, et cetera. The resource management is also is one of the biggest parts of the review, and that is complete review of our food service account to make sure that all of our expenses were allowable expenses for the food service account. And we also were reviewed on vendors, how much was paid to each vendor, how we procured those vendors, and so on and so forth. We were reviewed on our civil rights compliance. We were reviewed um, on site, so an auditor actually came to Fairborn Intermediate and sat through an entire day with our staff, um, reviewed everything from food so safety, temperatures, serving sizes, um, et cetera, throughout the day. And then we were reviewed, or we were audited on our wellness poly policy. Over the course of this review, we had two points where we were offered technical assistance. There is an attachment here in your little packet that I gave out, the exit report that kind of goes over what those two points of technical assistance were. And they were essentially that we had not hung up items on the wall from moving out of the old building. So um, we, you kind of can't hang anything on the wall for the first year and then we had just not gotten those up on the wall. So that was done before the auditor left that day. And then we received one corrective action and that was on our verification process and I filled out a waiver for verification and that was approved and I misunderstood what the purpose of that waiver was and so I had to redo the verification process and that has also been resolved since then. Um, I would just like to say thank you to my amazing team at Fairborn Intermediate and our amazing team at every school. I'm really happy to be able to present a successful audit that reflects all of their hard work and dedication to our students at Fairborn City Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Very, very good Thank job. You. Okay, Mr. Browning, that completes our district presentations for tonight. Okay. So next on the agenda is budget and finance. Um, there's two items. One is the monthly financial report and then uh, the resolution accepting the amounts and rates of the various taxes. If I could get a motion a second, then if there's any comments. So move. Second. Any thoughts or comments? Do you have any comments, Mr. Steininger? No. Nope. Go ahead and take roll then. Mr. Steininger. Yay. Mrs. Malad. Yes. Ms. Landon. Yes. Mr. Browning. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next is administrative reports and superintendent recommendations. 
Uh, this goes all the way to the middle of page seven. And uh, there's a few things of note in here. Uh, the first is Tammy Gendro, uh, becoming the principal at Fairborn Intermediate. Uh, we're gonna miss Betsy, Betsy leaving, but the building's in, is gonna be in very good hands. So, Gene, any comments? Yes, um, just to let everybody know, uh, Mrs. Amy Gayhart put together, as director of uh, uh, certified staff, she put together one great comprehensive interviewing process. Uh, there were inside candidates, outside candidates, and we included some of the teachers from the intermediate in this decision making. And uh, we are very confident the right decision was made, and the uh, intermediate will be in great hands, and uh, right person to succeed Betsy Wyatt and uh, Betsy I just want to say thank you for your services to the Fairborn City Schools and the and the difference you've made in a lot of kids lives over the years thank you okay. yeah, I just was gonna add this is another example you know we've been working hard to grow from within and uh, this is another example of that so congratulations and you're gonna invite us all to Zoom you <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then on uh, page four, halfway down, uh, a couple of retirements. Uh, Sue Minahan at FIS, uh, 37 years in education with 35 of them in Fairborn City Schools, so congratulations to her. Also, Linda Yoder, uh, our teacher at the high school, uh, same thing, 23 years in education and all of those years are at uh, Fairborn City Schools, so uh, two more of our staff that are going to be missed. So really that's about it. If we could get a motion and a second. So moved. Second. So any other comments or thoughts on any of the items? Okay. Mr. Pyle? Ms. Landon? Yes. Mr. Steininger? Yay. Mrs. Millad? Yes. Mr. Browning? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next is Gibson Donations. Wendy, could you Fairborn City Schools Board of Education would like to gratefully acknowledge the following gifts and donations. Blade Cutters Incorporated, $495. Fairborn Moose Lodge, $1068. Food items for the Hawk Pantry. Fairborn Women of the Moose Chapter, 917. Food items for the Hawk Pantry. Gamma Beta Chapter Epsilon Sigma Alpha. <laughs> Um, care of Mary Likens, clothing for the Fairborn Primary School clothes closet. Ed and Sandy Gibbons, $100 for the committee for after prom and $100 for the um, Ackerman relays. Uh, Mr. Max discount grocery outlet. There's two boxes of shelf stable food for the Hawks Pantry. Um, the Nishwitz Family Fund, $300 for the baseball uh, portable batting cage net. We have the Jennifer Whited Literacy Project, and Ed and Sandy Gibbons, $200. Michael and Teresa Gum, $100. Alicia Swope, $50. And Stephanie Webb, $50. Hall of Honor, Major General Scott Bergram, United States Air Force, retired, $100. Warren Brown, $500. Bob Carrico, $100. Jane Clifton, $100. Joan Dottel, $100. Joyce Dennis, $200. Craig Foreman, $50. Mike and Darla Foy, $50. Jack and Judy Gayhart, $250. Ed and Sandy Gibbons, $100. Major General Francis Gideon Jr., $100. Lieutenant Colonel James R. Hurd, $50. Harold and Mary Kaplan, $250. Tom Kirsch, $1,000. David Coker, $100. Class of 1954, Larry Heider, $100. Dr. Excuse me, Bruce Lamar, $50. Dr. Steve and Karen Martin, $25. Colonel Loyal, Laurel Mayer, $25. The Ron McDermott family, $100. Max and Linda Miller, $100. Dave and Alan Nevis, $100. Norma Nicola, $25. Bob Parsons, $25. Dr. Michael and Delia Rethman, $1,000. Dr. 
Dr. Joseph and Laurie Ritchie, $250. Michael and Kathleen Stewart, $100. Phil and Mary Spar, $100. Colonel Chud Thornberry, $50. Jane, Train, and Family, $100. And Stephen Wallover, $100. Thank you to everyone that has made these donations. Everything is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Next is executive session. Mr. Mr. President, if we could have a motion and a second for moving to executive session for the specified purpose of discussing negotiations. I move. I'll second. Ms. Landon. Yes. Mrs. Malad. <laughs> Mrs. Malad. Yes. Mr. Steininger. Yay. Mr. Browning. Yes. Motion carries. We anticipate going out of uh, into executive session, come out of executive session, uh, vote on the uh, remaining two items um, on the agenda, and then go back into an executive session. So we need a break before we move. Probably move to the other room. Okay. 